Christ came and fulfilled the Hebrew mindset of the word of God. And there's this other process where God was doing a work in the Greeks where he also fulfills the idea and concept of the logos uh, that made the gospel palatable to the Gentiles. And so uh, all that to say is, is that what if Lewis experienced in similar fashion to Paul um, an experience where he was caught up and saw in a, in a spiritual way, the forms or the, the eternal ideas of these forms that he talks about here. Hey everybody, welcome to Contra Talk. My name is Richard Henry and uh, this is a new season of the show. Uh, I've got a guest today. He's a good friend, longtime friend, um, Jay Williams. He's going to be talking about artificial intelligence, all the tech, the ins and outs, all the interesting things that uh, may be fiction, nonfiction. He's actually getting, um, he's studying this. He's been in this a long time. So we're going to be talking and uh, just get to know him a little bit more and help us better understand this subject. Hey, brother. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Doing well. Yeah, it's uh, it's nice to be with you, brother. And uh, yeah, just been watching your work from afar and enjoying uh, all the different topics you bring onto the show and some really good speakers that I admire a lot. I uh, had yeah. Dr. Well, Haken on last year. And, I did. Uh, yeah. That's uh, probably talk. one of my favorite professors I've had personally at, at Southern Seminary. He's mine too. Uh, Wonderful, wonderful teacher. Yeah. And a fellow fellow Canadian at that. He is. He is. He is. That's right. Yeah. So you're from Canada. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, share with the audience who you are. You're married. You got kids. And uh, and we'll get into the subject. Yeah. So uh, from Saskatchewan, Canada, uh, I am married to my high school sweetheart, uh, Tanya. We have five kids, four boys and a girl. So uh, our house is uh, busy all the time. <laughs> uh, we, uh, I pastored previously to coming to Louisville. Uh, 2018, we felt God's calling to come to campus here at Southern Seminary. So I finished my MDiv on campus and then uh, started my PhD program. And in that journey led to this topic uh, through conversations and how God or organizes and orchestrates in his providence our lives. And I'm uh, just in the middle of writing my dissertation on, on uh, specifically Ray Kurzweil, but the topic of artificial intelligence. So yeah. that brings us here to today. It's, uh, it's yeah. good to be on the show with you, brother. No, absolutely. Again, thanks for, thanks for coming on. Um, it's a pretty broad subject and those listening, watching, uh, it's, it's something that we've had kind of had the advent and I'd say the last month or so with, you know, the artificial chat GPT or, you know, the college essay, we don't need to write college essays anymore. The computer will do it for us or even painting and pictures. And I mean, even all sorts of crazy media stuff, whether it's face swapping, voice recognition, there's all sorts of things that I'm already kind of a skeptic at heart. <laughs> and <laughs> now I see this stuff and, and who knows? I mean, you see one news story and then something else. And I'm surprised it didn't play a bigger role even in the 2020 uh, general election, presidential election and things. But we're going to get into a little bit of that. But I think even deeper, uh, especially with your expertise in, in talking about AI and uh, curse file, and we'll look at some book recommendations later on. So uh, I guess just the first question really is, why did you choose this subject? What, what brought you to that point? Because it's very unusual in one sense, uh, or at least, you know, it'd be unusual, say, 10 years ago, even. Yeah, that's a good question. I think, you know, looking back, I think as like, you know, as a child and through my upbringing, I always had a natural draw towards technology. Um, you know, we grew up in the video game generation, which, you know, it was a big part of my childhood, all my friends. So I think right away, uh, our interaction with uh, the digital world and with the, uh, the technological world was just an intuitive part to my upbringing. I never foresaw at any point in the past that it would become a part of my uh, professional research um, interests. But uh, really, for me personally, it was an interaction with C.S. Lewis's uh, space trilogy that mm -hmm. had a profound impact on me, specifically um, the ability of a writer to write truth into fiction. Mm. So Lewis was writing in the mid thirties and the early forties, that trilogy. Uh, so really in the midst of world war two. 
And, uh, you know, you think about that, you think about the Inklings, the Oxford Inklings, uh, C.S. Lewis, J.R.R. Tolkien, Charles Williams, um, the, probably the main three of the group. Mm -hmm. These men were, were active soldiers in World War I, most of them. Uh, and here England is being bombed by the Germans and they're in the middle of all these big writing projects. And you sit there and think like, does that make any sense? Like that these <laughs> men of action would be writing fictional stories in the midst of their country being at war and the world being at war. Mm. And you take that, that thought and then you apply it to what you start reading and what he's actually saying. And uh, for me, a lot of things changed. All of a sudden I started to see that he's, no, he's actually writing about very serious topics in a fictional work, fictional work to get this out into the general audience so that people have an understanding of some deeper level uh, potential threats to our Western culture. And mm -hmm. three of the things that he addresses in that series is interplanetary travel, artificial intelligence, and a universal propaganda machine. Mm. Uh, so I'm reading this and all of a sudden I, I realize like I'm living in the midst of a generation where these things are reality. And you just got to sit there and think about that for a second, that what Lewis was saying, here's here's some things that are coming in the future. Now, all of a sudden, it's like, wait a minute, that's today. And uh, from that, in God's providence, uh, I was drawn into a natural rhythm of just wanting to understand artificial intelligence and then thinking deeper about as a as an image bearer, somebody made in the image of God. Where is the defining line of technology as it relates to humanity and our human nature? Mm. And uh, it sort of it sort of progressed from there. But that was that for me was the uh, the doorway into a passion for for looking deeper into this and asking deeper questions about that relationship. Yeah. So was it is this the first time then you've studied really gotten into it? I mean, obviously in the MDivs and the Masters, you know, we're not really general at least it's southern we don't require uh, a thesis or they don't require a thesis usually um is this the first time you really i mean you mentioned an article which we'll talk about in a moment uh that you've published but were there other times that you 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 read something beyond like what you just explained or something that brought, prompted you to say yeah this is this is vital we need to look at this or had that had that work out yeah so i would say that C.S. Lewis was for sure the the work that I read that initiated the deeper questions about wait a minute this is a this is a serious conversation taking mm -hmm. place here about a, um, an issue that could transform the world uh, on a deeper level. But I, I did two master's degrees, so my my master's degree before my MDiv is a master's of arts and leadership management. And during my thesis in that, I developed sort of a an anthropological perspective on human synergy. And oh. uh, so, so that wasn't directly related to technology, but it, it was something that was laying the foundation of what, what was humanity in the original creation, mm. you know? So from a naturalistic perspective, we were, we were nothing and that we progressively by Darwinian mechanisms evolved into the creatures that we are today. And um, where, where we see, intelligence or what appears to be intelligent design it's really just the outworkings of the anthropic principle mm -hmm. that there is a a myriad of universes that exist we happen to exist in the universe that we do therefore we see intelligence but it's not really attributed to a creator it's just the process of we just happen to live in a a, a creation that looks like it was designed but it really isn't <laughs> gotcha. uh yeah so of course so, that's just very convenient, very convenient. Yeah. It's, it's convenient, you know, from that worldview perspective. But as a Christian, I was saying, okay, God creates us in his image, in a perfect creation, with perfect relationship with himself. Um, within the triune Godhead, there's a perfect synergy. God creates Adam. He creates Eve. There's perfect synergy between masculinity and femininity with the triune Godhead. And mm -hmm. then he creates us for relationship with one another. So there's perfect synergy between man and woman. And then out of that, the offspring... Uh, our offspring reared in love are a unified picture of man and woman together. So my vision came to be that there was an omni synergy in the original creation. And if you read Genesis 131, it says that God created, when he looked on his creation, everything was very good. And uh, Augustine 
uh, in his, his work, the Enchiridion talks about um, a perfect good being representative of a world without evil. Mm. So in that creation, there's this perfect goodness, which you might refer to as holiness. Um, and in that holiness, there is the fusing power of love that synergizes our relationship with one another and our relationship with God. And it, it comes down from God into us from the relationship within the triune Godhead. Mm. And so in that context, our every thought, our every motivation towards one another would have always been for the good of the other. Uh, we would not have been hindered by sin. We wouldn't be hindered by things like envy or competition or, you know, we were talking before the show, just, you know, people willing to undercut one another and, in order to get ahead. Right. Um, it would have been different. It would have been a motivation where everything was for the good of the other and in support of the other. And in that context, we would have had perfect synergy to grow and develop and uh, create, innovate. Um, yeah, it would have been. So So that laid the foundation to what, what does it mean to be human? It's to have that perfect relationship with God. It's to have that perfect relationship with one another in the original context. Obviously, it's a fallen created order now. But out of that, the original design was we should flourish and create and innovate and uh, pursue technology. Um, but that would have been perfect in a world without sin. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, flesh out briefly, just give a definition you mentioned a moment ago, the anthropic principle. I'm not familiar with that. Uh, can you tell us what that is exactly? So, so Kurzweil would define the anthropic principle as um, where some see a divine hand, others see our own hands, namely the anthropic principle, which holds that only in a universe that allowed our own evolution, would we be here to ask such questions? Mm. So, so to sum <laughs> it up is it's very convenient. It's, we exist in, you know, uh, usually it, it's referred to in a topic about, uh, intelligent design, mm -hmm. but where, somebody from more of an atheistic background would say we exist in a world that appears to be designed. And that's only because we exist in this particular universe, this world. Gotcha. Out of a myriad of multiverse, uh, a multiverse of other worlds. Right. Yeah. Just like Dr. Strange and Spider-Man, right? Marvel. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. The, yeah. Uh, it's funny. Yeah. They kind of include that with, with fiction. I, it, it is pretty uh, remarkable. The amount of, influence movies and tv has on us which we'll we'll get to i think with ai and and talk about a few a few different ideas and even me reading which isn't nearly as much as what you've read of course but uh it's funny how some people think it's you know we're just on the cusp of terminator or or uh, matrix and others it's like nah that's you know eons away but we'll get to yeah that. <laughs> um so so Kurzweil, i remember him and looking at I think it was back when I was trying to, you know, figure stuff out 10 plus years ago, you know, as far as conservative and theology and this and this and this, and a baby believer at that point. Um, I remember watching Glenn, Bl Glenn Beck. Uh, and that was, I think he had just gotten on to Fox news from, I think it was CNN before. Anyway, he had curse vial on and, you know, I liked a lot of what Glenn Beck said. I don't really haven't watched him for years now, but you know, he was, he was a little different, a little bit kind of quirky, but also serious and he had Kurzweil on and it was kind of creepy and like very unnerving because he had mentioned how he, that is Kurzweil, uh, predicted a number of inventions and, and like certain things. Cause he's what, I don't know, in his seventies, I assume something like that. Yeah. Um, and he mentioned how he takes vitamins, you know, all these particular vitamins because a spoiler alert, and you'll probably say it, but at least then it was basically his idea was I'm going to upload my consciousness to, you know, the cloud or whatever, to some to some kind of hard drive, uh, which you probably know far more about. But I just remember the conversation. And even when I visited Southern back in 2013, it was an open Q&A. And I asked Moeller because I'm like, I don't know who else to ask. This is this is weird. Nobody's talking about this. And of course, Moeller knew who it was, Albert Moeller. Um, and it was like, you know, I, I forget his answer. I mean, it was, you know, fairly, fairly deep uh, as, as Mueller gives, but it, it still wasn't quite satisfying, but it was like, it was enough to be like, okay, 
This isn't as big of a threat. So anyway, my point is that he was very, it was just, there was something different about even that interaction, the, the vibe, if you will, giving off that he was doing. And, and just, it was just, it was just weird. And so anyway, so you, you studied him or he's, he's kind of a big major part of your dissertation. Uh, I know you haven't published your dissertation yet, so you don't want to talk about that. That's fine. Flesh out a little bit about either what led you specifically to him and kind of just the ins and outs. You can talk about the article you just published and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. Yeah. So um, again, in the, in the, I would just say in the providence of God, how I was led to Kurzweil, a friend had just recommended, Hey, you should, you should read this book by Ray Kurzweil. And it was his seminal work. The singularity is near. Mm. Um, now, not yeah. the old cell phone company, which used to be an orange <laughs> cell phone company that merged with AT&T. Not them. Not them. I, no. I always thought that. I was like, what? Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's this this uh, this book right here. Um, so he published this in 2005. And he had published uh, a number of works before that. Um, but this is sort of was his seminal work and vision for the future of artificial intelligence and transhumanism. And I, I think that what clicked with Kurzweil when I read him is that I think I think similarly to how mm -hmm. he thinks. He, he is an architectural thinker. So mm -hmm. he thinks big picture and cast vision. And I just tend to naturally be drawn to think like that. I'm not a, a quick processor. I'm, I'm more of a sit back and think about it and, and stew on things for a while uh, type of thinker myself. Um, but as I read the book, I realized, oh, my goodness, like, I can see how this could be viable based mm -hmm. on based on what he's presenting here. And uh, it, it sort of started there for me in my my academics. But from there, it branched out into reading um, a lot of the main thinkers in, in that field and uh, and really ultimately seeing a false gospel, mm -hmm. which is what my dissertation will be about. I'm going to hang back from that now. But this is sure. this is a humanist gospel to the world that once it becomes viable, will be very formidable uh, against the gospel of Jesus Christ, mm. because people will see it with their eyes. Yeah. And I'm not saying it's going to be miraculous. Um, I'm not even saying that they're going to be able to accomplish this, but as these technologies develop, it'll become increasingly believable that they will. Yeah. And I think that's, that's where, uh, in my heart to protect people, my, my vision is, is how can I help explain what Kurzweil is saying in a way to introduce it to people so that they can see that threat for themselves and then mm -hmm. begin to generate a Christian response to this gospel um, that's being presented. So, yeah, so that's that's how I came to um, sort of how the Lord led my journey towards Kurzweil. But uh, yeah, as far as as far as his worldview perspective. So if we dig into world Kurzweil, he he comes from a background. He, he was sort of raised in the Unitarian church. And one of the things he talks about in his childhood that really influenced him is just that the Unitarian uh, Unitarian church embodied that there are many paths to truth. Mm. So uh, he does come at his worldview from a very relative perspective um, that we all sort of are on this journey towards truth. We can have different gods, but ultimately everybody gets uh, increasingly as you follow truth, we draw closer to the same place. Uh, so he says in one of his books, he says, in a Unitarian church where we studied all the different religions and the theme was many paths to the truth, we noticed that even though they use different metaphors and different stories, the religions all describe God in the same way as being unlimited using language like God is all knowing, God is infinitely creative infinitely loving and infinitely intelligent. So sort of, uh, you know, the idea that the idea of God, he's, he's not a, a theist um, right. as far as what I can gain from what he writes. Mm -hmm. I do think he gives assent to a creator, which we could talk about later, which I find fascinating. Um, but he, he's just saying like truth is relative. We can believe in God, but really humanity is we're on our own. Yeah. Uh, for the most part, uh, he talks about in his childhood, his his uh, ancestors fled Nazi Germany. Um, and uh, after after the war had settled, there is this really important uh, event that happened in his grandfather's life where he went back to Europe and he was able to hold in his hands a copy of Leonardo da Vinci's um, 
descriptions and illustrations of his inventions, like an original mm. copy. Wow. And uh, as he reflects on that experience, it sort of gives us a, a lens into his worldview. He says, grandfather described this experience in reverential terms, you mm. know, and, and naturally that would be uh, an amazing experience. And I don't know how he, he came to have the connections to be able to actually do that, but he must have been a significant person. Mm -hmm. uh, he says, yet these were not documents written by God, but by a human. This was the religion, if you will, I grew up with the power of human ideas to change the world. This philosophy was personalized. You, Ray, can find those ideas. Hmm. So he has he has a very strong belief in the power of human uh, intelligence to change the world. And he sees himself, I would say, um, in an honest way, as being specifically at a young age um influenced to believe that he could change the world through his his inventions yeah. and uh even to the extent that he's using this analogy of da vinci uh in applying it to his own thought and uh, i admire him for that i think that that's built into uh being created in the image of god i think we have been dumbed down through naturalism mm -hmm. but we have so much potential intellectually Every human being has genius that can be tapped into uh, that we don't because we've been basically told that we're just evolved animals, get a paycheck, live the good life. Yeah. Um, and, and that's fine. All of those things are fine and good. But um, the elementary assumptions should be different, that we have infinite potential in our knowledge because we're made in the likeness of God. Mm -hmm. So so I admire that about him. But those are kind of a couple stories that give you like a little bit of insight into his worldview, how he sees intelligence and how he sees the, the potential of humanity, how he sees himself. Mm -hmm. I will say on a practical level, um, his grandmother and his family established one of the first schools in Europe that allowed women to study in academics. Mm -hmm. And his grandmother was one of the first ladies to receive a PhD in Europe. Uh, oh, wow. So very significant on that front, uh, yeah. what his family had done. And then uh, in the early 60s, he talks about living in New York City, and there was only 12 computers in all of New York City. <laughs> 12. <laughs> wow. And uh, at uh, 60 years ago, it's crazy. 12 years old, uh, he was one of uh, the first, like, young, you know, aspiring inventors to be able to, it says uh, he connected with Flower Fifth Avenue Hospital in Spanish Harlem. And uh, he would go to the hospital at midnight and stay there until 8 a.m. working on computers because uh, <laughs> of his passion for, uh, for, for computers. Yeah. So even from a young age, yeah, you can see in him just this desire for innovation to change the world um, and also specifically a draw towards technology. And, and if you can imagine any 12 year olds that'll go to your local hospital to sit on a computer from midnight to 8 AM. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, I, I can't wild. think of, I can't think of many. Yeah. So anyway, no, that's good. Um, can you speak into a little bit? So we, you mentioned CS Lewis and I know you've studied him a little bit and you were even able to go over to England and uh, study some, extra stuff there at Oxford. And um, of course he was professor at Oxford for a long time. Uh, and then Kurzweil, both in some of our other conversations and feel free to go as deep or as, as shallow as you want, but there's, there's definitely a, it's not just naturalistic though. It's not just human brain only as even his worldview would demand. Right? Again, we're just kind of a brain on a stick is what the naturalist says, right? It's just, here's the universe. We're here. We're just chemicals. We've got our five senses and that's it. However, even with Lewis, of course, was a, a believer, uh, but thought much deeply about many things compared to most people, it seems, especially today. Um, but Kurzweil, of course, isn't even close to anything, even pretending to be a Christian. Yet, even in that conversation that I watched 10, 11 years ago with Glenn Beck, that there seems to be this spiritual element, that there's this supernatural thing. And I know that's, I think it was you, maybe it was somebody else, talking about that even with C.S. Lewis to a degree and kind of almost prophesying and seeing certain things in the future. And there's debate on how that happened or if that happened. Can you speak into that a little bit and just kind of the supernatural element of like what and how deep it is and, and everything else? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I guess I guess what I could say at this point is, yeah, I think that I think 
um, I, I'm not an atheist. I am, I'm a theist and I do, I do assume a supernatural element to reality um, and every day of, of our lives on planet earth that uh, we are um, a part of a, a very profound and very uh, intentional creation story that is being unraveled by God. And in that process, he uses us um, uh, in that story to do uh, sometimes things that are beyond just the bounds of what people would call human rationality mm-hmm. or, or logic. Um, C.S. Lewis specifically, there's just, I mean, there's so many stories about his life that, that just break the mold maybe is the best way to say it compared to, you know, the average biography you would read um, yeah. or the works of, you know, uh, most writers, you know, for instance, he, oh yeah. Yeah. McGrath. Al- that's... Alice McGrath. That was on my, that was number one on my book uh, recommendation for this year, but anyway, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so here, here's what I could say on this file. I, I would say with CS Lewis, I, I detect that there was some level of supernatural interaction that he had Um what would I what would I base that on? Um, well, there's many things. I mean, he 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 could just be a savant in his intelligence, but uh, his, a book written by, um, uh, for instance, um, there's a book written here called Irrigating Deserts: C.S. Lewis on Education by Joel D. Heck. Um, mm. This is this is a fascinating book um, dealing with Lewis's perspective on education. Mm. Uh, my PhD focus is in higher ed and leadership. Um, so, yeah, I, I valued this work that Heck produced. But he, he talks about a number of things in there about Lewis's life that I, I didn't know in all of my reading about Lewis. I hadn't come across it. But he had such a memory um, that there's there's stories of him sitting like with his colleagues at Oxford and they'll challenge his ability to recite like by memory a page from the works that he had read. Mm. And so basically he, wow. he wouldn't, he, he was a humble man, but he would sit there and a student would be like, you know, what about this page out of this book? And <laughs> Lewis would be like, okay, well give me a line out of it. They go retrieve the book, just any book that the, the student had picked, read a line and he would recite the rest of the page by memory. Wow. That's how unreal. Does that, how does that happen? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's it's pretty fantastic when you think about it. Yeah. Uh, so he had he had a prolific memory, um, but he had experiences that were very um, platonic in nature that he talks about. Uh, so a couple things I could share on this front that have inspired me in my my Lewis uh, journey is uh, when he was just little, he talks about these three experiences in Surprised by Joy that he had as a as a young boy, where he discusses. Um, in one instance, like experiencing the very um, form of fall. Drawing from uh, C.S. Lewis's Surprise by Joy, he talks about three experiences he had as a young boy. And I'll just read a, a quick glimpse of this, but they, they, they're very curious. He says, the first is itself the memory of a memory. As I stood beside a flowering currant bush on a summer day, there suddenly arose in me without warning as if from some depth, not of years, but of centuries. The memory of that early morning at the old house when my brother had brought his toy garden into the nursery. It's difficult to find words strong enough for the sensation which came over me. Milton's enormous bliss of Eden, given the full ancient meaning to enormous, comes somewhere near it. It was a sensation, of course, of desire, but desire for what? Not certainly for a biscuit tin filled with moss, nor even though that came into it for my own past. And before I knew what I desired, the desire itself was gone, the whole glimpse withdrawn. The world turned commonplace again, or only stirred by a longing for the longing that had just ceased. It had taken only a moment of time, and in a certain sense, everything else that had ever happened to me was insignificant in Mm. comparison. Mm. And then he says, the second glimpse came through Squirrel Nutkin. Through it only, though I loved all the Beatrix Potter books, but the rest of them were merely entertaining. It administered the shock. It was a trouble. It troubled me with what I can only describe as the idea of autumn. It sounds fantastic to say that one can be enamored of a season, but that is something like what happened. And as before, the experience was was one of intense desire. 
And one went back to the book, not to gratify the desire. That was impossible. How can one possess autumn, but to reawake it? And in this experience also, there was the same surprise and the same sense of incalculable importance. It was something quite different from ordinary life and even from ordinary pleasure, something as they would say now in another dimension. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> and then he, he says in the last one, he says, the third glimpse came through poetry. I'd become fond of Longfellow's saga of King Olaf, fond of it in its casual, shallow way for its story and its vigorous rhythms, but then and quite different from such pleasures and like a voice from a far distant region, there came a moment when I idly turned the pages of the book and found the unrhythmed translation of Tegner's Drapa and read, I heard the voice that cried, Balder the beautiful is dead, is dead. Mm. I knew nothing about Balder, but instantly I was uplifted into huge regions of northern sky. I desired with almost sickening intensity something never to be described except that it is cold, spacious, severe, pale, and remote. And then, as in the other examples, found myself at the very same moment already falling out of that desire and wishing I were back in it. Wow. So, so here's my, my thought on this. So in a platonic fashion, um, where Plato <clears throat> discusses the, the realm of the forms and uh, the realm of the ideas, that the ideas are eternal, the forms are our reality where things are changing, but their forms are copies of the eternal ideas, really syncs up with Hebrews, um, the book of Hebrews, where basically the entire book is saying like, this world is just a shadow of the eternal. Mm -hmm. And when you think of the old covenant to the new covenant, the old covenant is like a, it's like um, the realm of the forms. It's, it's a covenant written in dust. And then when Christ descends the eternal into this realm of change, this corporeal realm we dwell in, he merges again the union between heaven and earth and becomes a physical body as a descendant of Adam, the eternal logos. And then the eternal covenant is revealed so that that covenant written in dust is now a covenant fulfilled from a heavenly perspective in the new covenant. Mm. And there's this beautiful process happening that I think influenced uh, Christ came and fulfilled the Hebrew mindset of the word of God. And there's this other process where God was doing a work in the Greeks where he also fulfills the idea and concept of the logos uh, that made the gospel palatable to the Gentiles. And so uh, all that to say is, is that what if Lewis experienced in similar fashion to Paul um, an experience where he was caught up and saw in a, in a spiritual way, the forms or the, the eternal ideas of these forms that he talks about here. Mm. And that's what he describes as joy. Yeah. So he had these moments where he had this experience that transcended his reality that we experience in the moment by moment experiences of this realm and was caught up into that realm and ever like his entire life after that is I want to get back there. And then you take that idea and you think about Narnia and there's a whole other layer of what's going on there yeah. um, that uh, is, is probably better for a different conversation. But <laughs> so, so you see this, you see this like amazing capacity he has, and then you see these experiences that he has is, or he has, and then he takes those two and he weaves them into his fictional writings to stir that joy up in us mm -hmm. uh, in a very profound way. So I think that's what I experienced reading Lewis. Uh, was that that was his intentionality. And I got glimpses of that where I realized, oh, I see what he's doing here. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, do you think there, there's a level of uh, supernatural or some sort of entity with uh, curse file? I mean, that is that his plan, right? To upload his consciousness to, to the cloud, right? Is it like he's going to live long enough? Is that, am I correct on that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So his his vision is, is that he believes like very soon, like within by 2030, that we're going to reach a point of singularity, which is the main you know, emphasis of his book, mm -hmm. uh, where human technology will merge with human biology and will open the door to eternal life, essentially. Um, so until we get that technology, though, his his passion is, is he wants to supplement his body, which what you're referring to. Um, as best as he can to preserve his physical body until 
that transition takes place and he can enter into eternal life here and now. Yeah. He doesn't believe he's ever going to die physically. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's what I thought. So, I mean, again, that's, that's such a religious concept. I mean, you read it a a few minutes ago about, you know, it's my religion, if you will, I think is what he said. And, you know, I I think just for the audience, it's good to remember that everybody's religious. I I will often say that even from the pulpit preaching and things, it's everybody is religious, just not everybody's a Christian. (laughs) Yeah. We think, oh, well, I'm not religious. I'm spiritual or I'm the, I don't really have blah, blah, blah. I, I believe in science or this and that. And it's like, you don't have eternal life concepts in science. You just have, I mean, if, if Darwinism is true, it's nothing but death and suffering. That's it. There's, there's no joy. As you said with Lewis, there's no life as even with Kurzweil is looking for, there's just death and suffering. That's the, that's the creator. That's the mechanistic sort of, you shouldn't get married. You shouldn't have children. Or if you do just have as many kids as you want, you shouldn't work hard. You shouldn't treat people like you want to be treated. You shouldn't do anything. It's just survival of the fittest. I mean, that is quintessential Darwinism. Yeah. Uh, and of course, Kurzweil isn't that at all. Um, and so at least it doesn't seem to be, um, he might be in some capacity, but yeah. So his, his spiritual side, going back to, uh, the previous question is his, he sees human consciousness and, and our like future, um, evolution where we, we assume the role of the creators of the future steps of evolution Mm -hmm. to be a spiritual experience, but he doesn't get in deeper than that. He hints at it. I think in this next year, he's publishing a book called The Singularity is Nearer, where he's going to delve into that in (laughs) a deeper way. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's really close now. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah. And he targets this as happening in the next decade. Yeah. Now, what what gives him now? It was. Am I again? Maybe I'm remembering incorrectly, but did he predict as it were, or have a part in like several, you know, tw- mid 20th century inventions was Glenn Beck, that conversation. I might be rem- remembering wrong, but you know, that's where some, sometimes to me, I've got my own theories, but what, what, do, what did you experience in, in studying this? Uh, yeah. So he, he does have a pretty good track record of as an inventor. I mean, okay. he's got, he's got a lot of his early technologies became the baseline and and foundation to what we have in our cell phones today, just drawn from different, different areas. So he's got, you know, an electronic keyboard he developed. He's worked with devices that help disabled people with um, being able to communicate through computers in the early stages. And a lot of the uh, developments that he would build on came from those early designs that he had created. So, yeah, I think he is a, a prolific mind, uh, a yeah. beautiful mind. But as far as the singularity, I think he's, as far as what he was talking about in 04 and 05, he's probably been moderate, like, he's been uh-huh. accurate. A lot, of, a lot of what he predicted did come to pass, but I would say it's, you know, like maybe like a moderate uh, accuracy. But it's not saying that they will not come to pass in the years ahead. I just going to take a little more time yeah. uh, to come to fruition. What, um, what is he? So he works at Google, right? He's some big wig at Google and helps them with their, all their big picture stuff. Right. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's a, he was the director of engineering at Google. Now he's, he's just a, an, a, an engineer as far as uh, I understand what he's doing right now. Gotcha. But he has a whole, like he's got m- multiple corporations, that he's running like some they're working with designing human body parts mm-hmm. um, that, you know, are being tested on animals right now, but eventually there'll be a market for, if you need heart surgery, you can just get a new heart uh, right. that's installed. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he's, he is, he has got his hands in a lot of different worlds. Yeah. yeah. Outside of Google, but specifically to AI, Google, you know, is obviously probably the most formidable artificial intelligence um pioneer in in the world yeah and he's definitely up you know at the head of what's going on there the largest i could say this the i just read a book by one of his associates so the largest endowment for um technological research was just made out in his name and i think that the first installment was um somewhere upwards around a hundred million dollars. It's one of many, wow. but contributing to that is corporations like Apple um, countries like Saudi Arabia have contributed mm. to this. 
to see his singularity vision come to fruition. Yeah. So he's, so, for, he's formidable in every way. Yeah, no, it sounds like it. Uh, before we get too scary, uh, flesh out again for, for the, uh, for us, for the audience and me, uh, the singularity, like, we, cause there's some stuff that Elon Musk has said that you and I've had conversations about with his company, not Twitter, of course. Now everybody either loves it or hates him, but you know, uh, the neural link where you have this basically connection, the human connection. We'll talk about that in a moment, I hope. But what is the singularity? Cause that was something for me, especially as a, as a, younger, more immature believer over a decade ago, looking at that and saying, uh, I don't like this. This is weird. This is a little scary. This is a little unnerving. Somebody might listening now kind of think, what? How, how, how we're, we're going to lose the image of God somehow, or there's some, we're going to, this isn't good. You know, there's some, something in the back, at least of my mind, maybe others that this is like, ah, this is, uh, I don't know it, either, you know, give us either some encouragement or at least tell uh, what the singularity is, what he's looking to do. And, you know, is it really a possibility? Are we really looking at, you know, matrix and, and, and minority report and terminator and these other type things or, or, or what are we looking at? Yeah. Yeah. It's <clears throat> so essentially he considers himself a patternist. That would be his defining label. He, and he would say human beings are, are patternists. So, he, he talks about the six epochs of history. And in his paradigm, he would say epoch one, basically basic patterns emerge out of energy and matter. Mm -hmm. In epochs two and three, um, early evolved creatures, um, biological systems evolved DNA and sort of like a, an elementary but precise digital system mm -hmm. to store information. And then that led to the early developments of the human brain. And then he would say in Epoch 4, humans begin to develop technology. And so technology would be, you know, the, the original acts being created sure. or, yeah. you know, elementary tools that we would look at today. But what they are is they are, they're tools to produce work, but they're also extensions of our minds. Mm -hmm. So, so to illustrate that uh, in class and I've given presentations is, if you consider like, you know, holding an ax in your hand and chopping down a tree, the ax is doing what your mind and your body are forcing it to do as if it's a part of your system. Mm -hmm. Now, you could you could fast forward to today and put yourself in a 918 Porsche Spider and drive that thing uh, in such a way that you are so in tune with the car that it feels like you're not even paying attention to what you're doing because you're just thinking and the engine's responding to exactly what you're telling it to do at any given moment. Mm -hmm. So we have this capacity as human beings to take other objects and make them extensions of our mind. And uh, so Kurzweil uh, in this fourth era or epoch, he would say we started to develop technology. And as that happened, it gave us an edge over other evolved species to where we completely separated from the rest of uh, the, uh, the species on Earth. Yeah. A defining moment and then as technology grew forward on the basis of pattern recognition he would say today we're, we're not at epoch five yet but that's where the singularity is going to take place and it's the it's the moment in time where technological evolution uh exceeds biological evolution and essentially uh he uses a term called the law of accelerated returns and what what that concept is saying is that technology is exponential in the sense that as one field of technology grows, another field benefits from that growth and it begins to grow. And as mm -hmm. that grows, another field grows. And as those different fields begin to have progress in an exponential matter, there'll come a point where they just leave us behind. Yeah. So that was as a oh, God. Oh, I was just going to say, so, so at that point, He's saying um, they will increasingly become like uh, Nobel Prize breakthroughs mm -hmm. will begin to happen like on a weekly basis, okay, on a daily basis, on a momentary basis as computer intelligence excels far beyond what we're capable of collectively. So would this be considered just transhumanism then? That's kind of like the, the, the common vernacular. It seems like people are transhumanist, transhumanism. Was that more or less what that is? 
Yeah, so I think that that yeah, that is where transhumanism comes transhumanism comes into the picture because then the question is is he he brings up this idea of where is the defining line of um what we limit humans to receive from a technological perspective where we no longer become human. So he's like, if you were to have one uh, transplant with a non-biological organ, mm -hmm. uh, would that be considered you're, you're no longer human? What if you had two transplants? What if you had five transplants? Yeah. And then he says, well, what about when we establish nanobot technology? What if you had a million nanobots injected into your system? What if you had 5 million? What if, and I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm speaking from the top of my head, so I'm not giving exact numbers, yeah. but he's, he's using that logic <laughs> of, okay, technology is becoming increasingly invasive to our biology. At what point do you say, oh yeah, that person is no longer human. Mm -hmm. So when that technology of the singularity becomes viable, his question is, is either, you know, I think this is where we're naturally led. Elon Musk um, uses this logic Either we're left behind or we have to merge with technology and become a cyborg to remain relevant. Yeah. When, isn't that what uh, Kurzweil is promoting, though, in the sense that, I mean, it sounds like it, like if you now have a, bio, a bionic heart, right, and, and your lungs and, you you know, you were riddled with cancer and now the three or four main organs are swapped out for, you know, synthetic bio or bio and tech merging. Isn't that the same thing as, you know, the neural link? drilling the 10 centimeter hole in your head and, you know, basically extending a web over your brain and connecting to the internet. Isn't that kind of the same thing or am I missing that? What, what What's going on there? Yeah. So I would say that's the, the first step towards transhumanism, right? So if here, here's the logic, if machines are super intelligent, mm -hmm. we will become obsolete. Like Elon Musk uses the illustration, like it'd be the equivalent of talking to a rock. So, um, you know, uh, and I and here here's my my thought on like how that comes to be. It's it's really artificial intelligence. So machines are drawing from the intelligence of billions of people who have a digital interface today uh, with their interaction with through our phones, through our computers. You know, whatever medium we're using, we have a digital image that's being made in our image as we mm -hmm. interact with the digital world. Artificial intelligence can can cross-reference through all of that data increasingly to make it, you know, essentially the product of billions of minds created in the image of God. So there is this artificial omniscience emerging out of that, that I'm not saying is sentient, and we can talk about that later, but that has a capacity for deduction and inductive logic mm -hmm. to pull from all of these minds simultaneously. So for one individual to compete with that, how do we do that? And so Elon Musk would say the best thing we can do is join with that technology so that we become super intelligent as well. Right. And how do we do that? Well, essentially what you know, Neuralink, Elon Musk's company Neuralink uh, aspires to do is to create a, a chip that they drill, uh, I think it's a 10 millimeter hole into your skull. They place... Uh, a thousand wires, this machine does the surgery, a thousand wires into the neural connections of your neocortex. And then your mind extension becomes the cloud. Mm. So through that receiver, as they are able to study the neural synapses of your brain, you're able to communicate without your vocal cords, uh, without your fingers. And mm. at the speed of thought, you'll be able to interact with the digital uh, realm. So so his idea is, is if we can become super intelligent ourselves, then we can compete with just a purely uh, like a computer intelligence that has super intelligence and remain rel relevant. Yeah. But but where they want to go. So where somebody like Kurzweil wants to go is that eventually to develop nanobot technology <clears throat> through a technology he describes as foglets that will be injected into our systems. And we'll be able to read our brain processes, our, our nervous system from the inside in real time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and then there's, there's other benefits to that. He's talking about like, we'll be able to cure certain diseases. We'll be able to detect diseases at their infantile stage and, and really a lot of good stuff. Mm -hmm. 
um, theoretically that you look at and you say, yeah, I, I love that idea, you know, to be able to cure cerebral palsy or help individuals who have spinal cord uh, injuries to reconnect, you know, the, the connections in their spinal cord that have been severed so that they can learn to walk again. Um, truly amazing uh, tech. Yeah. But, but as far as the AI goes, it's, it will be able to read the, the brain, image the brain at the genesis of your thinking. Wow. So then what is this? I, I mean, again, it's very, it's very, it's very uh, spiritual. It's very religious. It's very, uh, I would say in one sense, supernatural, uh, or at least it seems to have some hints to that. Do you suspect that curse file, you know, feel free to not answer too specifically if you want to, but him or maybe others like him, because there's all sorts of crazy stories about XYZ group or this person or in the Southwest of the United States or this place or these weird interdimensional things. We go back to places like, you know, Genesis six and, and the, the giants and the Nephilim. And like, there's a lot of weird stuff in the Bible that even modern Christians today were kind of like, Oh, I don't really, I don't really know what that means. And we might just ignore it or something, but it sure seems like there's for lack of a better word, help. Right? Cause even in doing some research with, for our conversation here. And I've got interest in a lot of things as well. Uh, I found a podcast and they they talk about all sorts of weird stuff. And some of the, in, some of the guests they were talking about, we're talking about say CERN, for example, and some other things and how they were basically connecting and, and hearing these ascended masters or getting wisdom from afar or from another dimension. Do you think that's at play here uh, with curse file and, and people like him? Well, um, yeah, I, so again, like as a Christian, I come at the world from a supernatural, um, I, I, I believe fundamentally that our world has a natural and supernatural order to it. And there are realms, uh, that I, I do believe, um, we interact with, uh, quite often and even unknowingly at times, um, as far as Kurzweil, he talks about being involved in transcendental meditation. Mm uh specifically in his book so he openly writes about that that um and and i think going back to c.s lewis uh his space trilogy it's fascinating but the the nice and that hideous strength the book that hideous strength is sort of this you know this evil organization that wants to take over the world and they they have like these scenes where you know, people are walking around in the NICE into the leaders' offices, and the main leaders are sitting there staring out at the moon with just this deadpan look on their face as if they're not present at all. And mm. uh, it hints at the idea of um, so there's the scene in That Hideous Strength where the leaders at the NICE uh, are, are in their offices, and employees wander into their office and they're they're sitting there looking out the window or sitting there looking at each other in another scene with just sort of this deadpan look on their face. Uh, and, and Lewis talks about how it was like they were, their bodies were present, but they're millions of miles away from where their bodies were. Hmm. And, uh, and it, it happens multiple times in that hideous strength. And uh, yeah. So, you know, when you read something like that, it, it brings to mind the idea of astral projection and I'm, I'm not endorsing astral projection. I'm just saying that Lewis writes it into his stories mm -hmm. as something that the people on, on the, the side of um, the line who want to take over the world are seeking wisdom from outside themselves. Yeah. Um, and not from God. <laughs> and not, and right. not from, not from God. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Uh, and you see it also in um, when you read Paralandra, the second book of the series, there's a key, guy the antagonist in the book is a guy named weston right. he's he's an acclaimed scientist who starts engaging with the protagonist of the story ransom and saying how his whole life he's been guided by an outside power and that this power is giving him wisdom and helping him to become you know the man who leads humanity and and human consciousness into the future uh, in a way that changes the, the future of humanity for humanity's mm -hmm. preservation and like all these grand statements. Yeah. And it ends up being that he's possessed by the devil. And uh, it leads to this interaction between this, this man ransom and the devil. And it's sort of a recreation of the, 
the biblical fall, but where mm-hmm. a human being defends, you know, the innocent uh, woman uh, from the devil's influence and is triumphant. Wow. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating story, but, but when you look at those things, so, so you get somebody like Kurzweil who talks about transcendental meditation and that he practices this on a regular basis. I'm not sure the level of spirituality that comes through, uh, in that with him, but the fact that he's referencing it as something very important to his life shows that there is this spiritual dynamic of him seeking, uh, right. something. And, um, so I can't speak beyond what he's published. Um, but within that realm, yeah, there is a spiritual side to him as well. Uh, I want to address this in my, my dissertation on a deeper level. So in a future conversation, I can go through a number of places in his writing where he, he really brings in a biblical paradigm, Mm -hmm. uh, but from a a humanist perspective that sort of feels diabolical. Mm. Um, so Wow. What I can share from, from my article is in Epoch 6, this is, this is the apex of his, his vision for humanity, is that technology will develop to the extent that we'll be able to program individual atoms with information. So the entire cosmos, all the matter in the cosmos, eventually is permeated by technological intelligence to the extent, and he has a conversation with Bill Gates at the end of the book where they do a <laughs> fictional dialogue together. A very they... good man, Bill Gates, he is. Anyway, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's not, interesting. Not creepy at all. Combine the two together, um, and this is published by Kurzweil, but their vision is, is that the entire cosmos would come to life and God himself would wake up. So they don't specifically go to Genesis 2, but think about that. Like, it's so clear. It's when God created man, he, he formed man from the dust of the earth and he breathed into him the breath of life and man mm-hmm. became a living being. So the soul is fused into the body. Well, they're saying man will make God in their image and breathe life into the dust of the cosmos and the entire cosmos will come to life and God will come to life. Wow. Yeah. Talk about blasphemy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. like, you know, it's such a fun, like, idea i guess if you're a godless pagan but like because god has placed the knowledge of himself and everyone that they they have those inklings even if they suppress the truth and unrighteousness that they have that and yet they at the same time will oh well now we're the ones who are creating god right this is you know the 18th 17th 18th century and and you know making god in our image and, and all the rest um post enlightenment and everything else it's um, brother. Yeah. Can I, can I throw one more thing out there? Yeah. Just scaling back to taking that concept. Now think about this. So nanobot technology injected into your body, they're able to see the Genesis of your thought. If they can map and, and I'm not saying they're going to achieve this, like the lightning storm that occurs in the, the three pounds of gray matter in our brains. Uh, they have no idea where it originates from. Everything lights up all at once. It's, it's one of the most amazing uh, creations that God has made by far. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. But think about this theoretically. If they can see the genesis of your thinking, so what you're thinking at any given moment in real time, they're stepping into the boundaries of God's relationship with us, right? So um, if you think about, just grab the text here. If you go to 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 11, uh, Paul there talks about like nobody knows a man except for that man and the spirit of God, which is within him. Well, all of a sudden now you have a third party coming into that conversation that can see even your communion with God. Because as you receive that communion from God in our prayer, as we as we interact with God and, and the thoughts that stream to our minds, that can all then be recorded. And so what you have is an internal eye mm. watching everything you do. Yeah. And so when you think about artificial omniscience, it's not just the collective mind that has the mind to cross-reference billions of minds that are made in the image of God, but now you have the capacity to watch internally that person in the genesis of their thinking. Hmm. And that's a reach into eternity in my perspective as a, as a Christian, that there's a supernatural communion between us and God that takes place that now is being recorded and watched. 
Yeah. Yeah. And that really seems to want to, again, go back to Genesis three, <laughs> you know, knowing good and evil, they will be, they will be like God, et cetera. And in one sense, uh, I don't know, there's, there's nothing in one of the sun. I guess, I guess, I guess for those of us or those who are listening, watching are like, Oh man, this is really creepy, weird. Uh, what is some encouragement for the average mom, dad, worker, small time pastor, student whatever the average christian uh or non-christian but uh, predominantly people watch us or are believers but what what's some encouragement and some uh, just a few books that somebody can pick up uh and hopefully we'll have you i'll have you on um again once the dissertation's published and everything like that we'll, we'll talk more about it uh but what are a few things just some you know words of encouragement and wisdom to say okay yeah but mm. what do you got yeah, so um, I would say um, first off that you know this is this may not this may not come to pass in exactly the way it's being envisioned now, but it's likely going to happen. Uh, and my reasoning for that is that this is also a arms race, uh, artificial intelligence supremacy. Any country that attains that will have an edge over any country in the world. Mm -hmm. So at a national and international level, this always, this has to be taken seriously. And we, we in the West have to compete with other nations who don't hold our ethical standards. Um, and we have to come up with an AI that can, that can defend us from our uh, way of life. Mm -hmm. So in a communist country versus a capitalist country, and I'm not just, I'm using that as an example, because that's more economics, but as a, a political influence, this is this is sort of we have to attain this over over others in the world who would use it for ne more nefarious purposes. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's likely going to happen from that perspective. Um, but here's where we take heart. Like the God that we serve is really and truly God. Mm -hmm. So so all the intelligence of humanity and and all the advancements, the benefits that this will bring, but the more nefarious side of this it doesn't even begin to compare to the, the intelligence of God himself. Yeah. He truly is omniscient. He truly is all powerful. And he is not, he is not deterred by any of this. What I really think is going on here is a reflection of Genesis 11. I think that this is a, a, a tower of Babel in the future um, that likely uh, is tied into second, uh, second Thessalonians chapter two, mm. that in the end, there is a, a restrainer that is going to be removed. And after that restrainer is removed, there's going to be an increase of lawlessness and rebellion against God. My, my thought is that restrainer is language itself. Hmm. When I think back to the old Testament, um, God restrained us in our sin. He, he restrained us at the flood, but at the tower of Babel, he placed a restraint on humanity that did what it limited our capacity to communicate and transfer information. So technology at, at the right point in time has eliminated that restraining boundary. And in that, it's allowing man to, again, create this unified rebellion against God, which will be from a human perspective and a satanic perspective, a demonic perspective, where men and the demonic realm try to reascend back into the heavens uh, from their fallenness from Genesis chapter three in an yeah. ultimate rebellion against God, which will bring back the return of the Lord. Yeah. So, so here's my, here's my encouragement. Um, we need to think seriously about these things. We need to think biblically about these things. Jesus told us to watch and pray. Mm -hmm. So as we move into times where we are starting to, to get into areas of thought that are really scary, our hope is steadfast and sure. Jesus Christ will return. Any, any attempts to thwart his authority will be lost. Mm. And those who are in Christ Jesus will be with him forever and ever. And uh, so there is, there is no ultimate fear we need to have in this. But what we can do is, is buy some books, have conversations with our friends, and just patiently pray and ask the Lord for wisdom and how we can help our, our children to navigate the tech world. Um, how we can use these technologies for good. I'm, I'm not against human innovation and technology. I think that that's fundamental to us being made in the image of God. 
So whenever the devil tries to use something for evil, how do we do what God does and spin it around and use it for good? Mm -hmm. And out there in your listeners audience and, and in all of us is genius that will be able to leverage this technology for good things that honor God. And uh, so, so that's my encouragement. A couple books that I would pass along. I think we should read broadly. Um, I think that every human being is made in the image of God and therefore there's inherent knowledge that we can, we can get from anybody, even if we completely disagree with their, their vision, like someone like Kurzweil has lots of good information mm -hmm. and ideas that I think are awesome and, and will benefit us. But the singularity is near. I would, I would recommend that it is a hearty read. So uh, that is, you know, going to take you deep, but you may have to read it a few times. Mm -hmm. um, a book by a guy named Thomas Malone. It's called Superminds. He's a MIT guy, but this is really helpful in understanding narrow intelligence and general intelligence uh, with artificial intelligence. Uh, a book called Life 3.0 by Max Tegmark. Uh, this is a really good uh, summary of a lot of um, like he's he's an MIT guy, but he really addresses a broad audience of thinkers on artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is a helpful book. Um, Nick Bostrom wrote a book called super intelligence uh, paths, dangers and strategies. He's an Oxford Oxford guy. Um, he, you know, again, he's not a Christian. He's, he's probably going to be very antagonist to our Christian faith, but he was a pioneer in simulation theory hypothesis. So if, if you haven't heard about simulation theory hypothesis, that, that is a very important conversation that needs to be had. Essentially, if, if the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution and, and naturalism and humanism led us to cast off God and the angelic realm and that man is the measure of all things, simulation theory hypothesis is like the matrix uh, in reality, which is being promoted by people like Elon Musk, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Stephen Hawking where they're saying, yeah, we're, we're basically just living in a, a simulated reality. Right. Uh, and so when, when we create a immersive virtual reality where a simulated reality is believable and indistinct from our natural reality, it's going to be very easy for your kids to believe that. And if they do, not only does God and angels not exist in heaven, but mom and dad don't really exist, your neighbors don't really exist, and ultimately your own identity doesn't really exist. Yeah. Uh, so that is going to be an enormous attack on human identity. Uh, but Nick Bostrom wrote one of the, I would say, the seminal articles on uh, simulation theory hypothesis, and he gets into it a little bit in this book. This is a very helpful book. It's called Alone Together by Sherry Turkle. Uh, she's connected to MIT. And this book is helpful for your kids, like working through why are we, why do we have so much loneliness in our youth? Um, why do we mm. feel so alone as, as adults? Well, here's why it's because we're completely connected online with one another, but we've lost the ability to do human face-to-face -face conversation. Right. And so she goes into a number of developments in that technology, but a lot of uh, other works that you can read just to help us think through a little bit more, um, our online interactions with one another and getting back to a human to human relationship, uh, yeah. which is fundamental to our health and well being. Um, finally, Jason Thacker, he's a Southern guy. Uh, or actually, I got two more. Uh, it's from Southern Seminary. I haven't read through the whole book yet. I'm working through it right now, but Following Jesus in a Digital Age. This is a, a wonderful book for moms and dads uh, and kids, teenagers to just really ask the questions of what is all this technology doing uh, that's good for us, mm -hmm. but where is it harming us? And yeah. just helping you to think through this on a, a very um, palatable way, um, which isn't, I've, I've been talking about more of the uh, sort of the theoretical nature of artificial intelligence. This is just like social media, cell phones, uh, teen depression, things like yeah. that, that he offers a really helpful look at. Okay. Uh, and then finally would be John Lennox's 2084. Right. That's what I just grabbed. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Um, that's, that's the extent of my reading on this subject. Uh, maybe I've read, I think I've read one other thing, but yeah. Okay. You know, yeah. yeah. You, you know what it is? It, it's a great book. This is, 
introductory level, but his footnotes, he takes you to all sorts of authors that'll branch out and get you if you want to read deeper on it. And I just appreciate John Lennox as a Christian apologist and thinker. Yeah. He's sharp. He's winsome. He's candid. Um, he just, yeah, does a very good job in a succinct way of introducing you to this topic. So. Yeah. yeah, and it's a smaller book. I know sometimes people can get overwhelmed with a 400, 500 page book and think well, that'll take two years to read that book. You know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. But this one's, I think less than 200. It's a small book though. Uh, it's a very, it's an easy page turner. So yeah, uh, that's yeah, definitely, definitely good too. Well, I appreciate it, brother. Uh, do you have any last closing thoughts you want to share with us? Yeah. Um, what can I say? I think, I think we just, uh, as Christians, we have been placed in, in um, this time, in this stage of human history, and that isn't by accident. So as good Christian thinkers have done through millennia, uh, we need to engage these ideas from a Christian worldview and bring the Christian voice into the conversation. Mm. And I think that it's very important that we do that. So, uh, yeah, I just encourage anybody out there to, if you, if you're drawn to pursue this area, this field of study, to do that with an unapologetic Christian worldview and uh, influence our colleagues that uh, hold alternate worldviews for the glory of God. Mm. Amen. So, that's no, my I, vision. I appreciate the time and we'll have you back on uh, and talk more about it when you have, when your work is published and uh, dissertation and, and degree is in hand, PhD and all that. So that'll be, that'll be fun whenever that is in the, in the near future, but we'll talk more about, I mean, there's so many kind of rabbit trails you can go on and it was even difficult for this to say well what about this what about this what about this i'm sure there's people <laughs> that thinking, well i heard this thing and that thing what about this guy and he said this and uh i i would say just as an addition since we didn't evolve in any sort of any sort of materialistic darwinian mechanistic way uh scripture doesn't say that reality doesn't say that actual science doesn't say that uh, i i take heart in knowing though there is people out there that want to help and do good things but also are clearly as you said spiritual in some capacity and trying to reawaken god they're starting from the wrong worldview and so their end goal if you start you know going north on say i-65 here in kentucky you're never going to get to florida you're never going to get down to alabama right you're just never going to do it and so you're gonna have to turn around and get on the right way the right direction and so in a simple way doesn't mean they're not going to try. It doesn't mean they're still not going to merge tech. And like you're saying, these things aren't going to happen in some capacity. Uh, but I would take heart that the, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, right? And that there's these things that people start off with, but their their theory or their foundation is incorrect. Uh, and therefore, their conclusions are likely going to be incorrect as well. So, Yeah, and I, I think on that front, brother, um, there's an inherent longing in humanity for that omni synergy that we lost in the beginning. Mm. So there's this deep undercurrent of longing for unity, longing for synergy, longing for casting off the effects of the fall. But any place outside of Jesus Christ is going to ultimately fail. Yeah. He has already done it. Yeah. Amen. He, yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's the per perfect end on. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, everybody, Thank you again for watching, listening, and uh, check out all the links for the books. I'll put those in the description. And again, thank you so much, Mr. J. Williams, soon to be Dr. Williams, not too far off. I appreciate the time, brother. <laughs>